Good day, everyone. Hello. Good morning for those of us in the U.S. Good afternoon for anybody anywhere else. Welcome to day three of uh, Radio Week. This is a um, session entitled Cloud and Virtualization for Radio Operators, the Why and the How. And, um, and we, have a, we have a great panel here. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to ask everybody just to speak for maybe like 20 seconds to introduce themselves. Um, generally, I, I just wanted to let everybody know we're going to, I'm, I'm thinking of this in like a, a, a general two part over the next hour. The first part is going to be um, kind of the, the cultural, the benefit, the risks, the um, 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 cultural and real estate, uh, basically the, the positives and negatives about hybrid workforce. Um, and then secondly, the, uh, the technology um, to support that. How do, how do we do that? I always think of the, um, the, uh, uh, the need coming first. I think it's because of my, my um, growing up as a kid reading um, early science fiction. And remember the, um, the, the three rules of the robots, right? From Isaac Asimov, where, you know, robots can't kill your human and things like that. So I always think the technology sh should generally support a need and support us as, as as human beings. So we'll start with the we'll start with the human aspect and then we'll end with the technology aspect. So so briefly, I'm Steve Schultes. I'm Chief Technology Officer with New York Public Radio. Uh, New York Public Radio is uh, actually it's coming up on its hundredth anniversary next year. Um, we uh, we have um, eight signals in the New York City. Yeah. Metropolitan area. Um, we're the largest um, affiliate um, of national public radio in the, in the United States. We're a podcaster. We deliver a petabyte and a half of data per month for uh, about 40 podcasts and 10 streams. Um, and um, and, and uh, our, we have a classical station and a news and talk um, uh, station. Um, Roz, do you want to go next? Introduce yourself, please. Sure. Uh, my name is Roz. Roswell Clark is really my full name, but everyone calls me Roz. So I'm the Senior Director of Radio Engineering for Cox Media Group. Uh, we own 54 radio stations uh, spread across mostly the southeast uh, and a bit, uh, um, in the center and northeast. Uh, so we not only have the radio division, but we also have TV and and some other things. Uh, part of my overall job responsibilities extends into the other divisions as far as business continuity planning, uh, dealing with, um, you know, the unexpected and I guess you could say the expected uh, disruptions to business. So uh, technology obviously is a big play player in that uh, contingency plans and, and alternate capacities and those sorts of things. So um, also these days, uh, as everyone is, we're kind of heavily into uh, preparing for and defending against cyber and that sort of thing. So I think that component of the technology will play into our conversation perhaps uh, this afternoon. Very good. Alex, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Alex Roman. I'm the CTO for Media Co Holding. Uh, we're in New York City, actually within uh, walking distance of uh, Steve's offices. Uh, we have two radio stations, Hot 97 and W. 1075 WBLS. Uh, they're both sort of iconic uh, hip hop and R&B radio stations that have been in their format for a very long time. Uh, Hot 97 was essentially the first commercial hip hop station in the US. And we're also a very big digital operation. We uh, have a huge video production uh, operation, our own apps, a lot of digital presence. Uh, so I oversee the technology for everything for the workforce, everything for the radio broadcasting operation, and then also the uh, digital media department. So glad to be here today. Very good. Hi, neighbor. Um, um, Udit, Udit has joined us. Um, Udit, could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, hi, guys. Uh, I'm Udit Tyagi. I operate in the capacity of the Chief Digital Officer for Mirchi. Uh, Mirchi uh, is an entertainment platform uh, specific uh, in India specifically. We, uh, we have approximately 70 plus frequencies, FM frequencies in India and five countries abroad. Uh, I am running the whole digital ecosystem for uh, Mirchi as a whole. Uh, I've been associated with the digital industry for more than uh, 13 to 14 years now. And as a part of the objective, uh, we started digitizing Mirchi as much as possible. We have a great video production team. At the same time, we have a publishing team. Uh, we're into podcasting, creating audio stories. We have our own apps, the Mirchi Plus app, and of course, the FM frequencies that you're aware of. Wonderful, Mirchi. Thank you. And Philippe, last but not least, another East Coast seaboarder. 
Yes, good morning, good afternoon, good day, uh, everyone. My name is Philippe Generali. I'm the CEO and president of RCS Worldwide. We are based in New York, and we are the largest uh, manufacturer of uh, automation software in the world. We have products that range from G Selector for programming the music, uh, to Zeta and NextGen for uh, doing the automation in the studio of a radio station, Acquira for the traffic. We have a new product called Audio Display, which uh, takes care of displaying um, information and advertising in the dashboard of your car. We have a new system and, and many other little pieces of software. We basically sell our software in 120 countries, and um, I'm delighted to be part of, uh, of that eminent panel of speakers. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Philippe, for joining us. Um, and just a quick shout out to Red Tech for really for organizing this and the whole Radio Week. Um, these are excellent discussions, and, um, and I hope we can all benefit from them in some way. Um, so, all right, so let's, let's jump into this a little bit. So, I mean, yeah, the elephant in the room, is, I think, is really, you know, we're, we're, you know, the pandemic left us, you know, like a slap in the face with a hybrid workforce. And whether we were ready for it or not, for mobilization and, and, and hybrid work, mobility, um, we, we were basically thrown into it. You had to do it to survive. You, you know, you had you, you had to support the business somehow to do that. Um, for New York Public Radio, we, we made, we, we just put together like um, surface kits with microphones and Pelican cases. We made 30 of these. We shipped them out to um, our guests for, um, cre for, uh, for our podcast creation, just to keep our podcast series going. Um, but then um, also, and, and now we're basically, frankly, we're struggling to actually come back into the office, if you will. And there are there are people that I think we will we will not see again in person. Um, and uh, the people who are maybe more vulnerable health wise. And then there's of course people who just you know they've gotten used to kind of um, you know the commute from the bedroom to the living to the living room, like like I am here today in my living room. Um, so um, so we're all kind of struggling with you know what do how, where how do we go forward and um i thought i would just kind of open that up a little bit um i know um alex uh, and i have chatted about um you know the 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 kind of the hardship of collaboration um depending on your station depending on your broadcast um you know is collaboration important or can you do it through zoom and through virtual apps or or what's missing from that um, Alex, could I pick on you for a second, just to t you know, to talk about a little bit what you've experienced? Sure. I mean, we were in the very same situation as you, where we were thrown into this and we scrambled. I ordered every you know codec I could get my hands on and uh, handed out every laptop that we had as fast as we could. And same situation where we are, um, where we want to sort of reorganize and get back into the office. And I mean, I feel like the radio industry is sort of a unique animal. Um, we have. A culture within our operations and I feel like maintaining that and being deliberate about that is part of what makes the product cohesive um, and that's one of the things that I feel we have to be we have to pay a lot of attention to and we need to make sure even if we do have people that are hybrid or remote employees I think we have to be deliberate about making sure that we're all a team and a group and everyone is able to communicate and see each other because I think you do hear it in the product um, so yes hybrid work is here to stay uh, hybrid elements of broadcasting are here to stay um, and there are advantages, there are pluses and minuses to it. Uh, we have the ability to have people that are, that are, that are on uh, the other side of the country contributing content. Uh, a lot of people have uh, tours that they go on or other, other events that they do. So we're able to, to bring in and support a good caliber of people with hybrid work. But what comes out of the speakers to the listener always matters. What sort of digital content we're producing always matters. And I think paying attention to where we end up is very, very important. Yeah, very good. You know, um, I have one uh, personal story about um, the, um, you know, we have we have on our news and information stations. Um, it's all very local. It's all it's all about New York City. Right. And um, however, we also have cultural magazine shows that could be speaking about anything in the world or the country. And and um, for the latter, I think, you know, the um, the hybrid workforce has really been a, a great benefit. Uh, for us, because we we have a person live on air every day from the state of Georgia, um, you know what's that um, fifteen hundred miles away, but um, um, but but 
And that, that's a contributor that prior to the pandemic, we could have never really entertained. We could have never solicited her to come to New York City um, and uh, because of just her lifestyle and, and her family and things like that. But now she's a, she's a great part of our business and, uh, and we see the benefit of that. Um, does anybody else have anything to contribute to that along those lines? And I can give a, if I can, I'll just give you one quick response to what you said. One, yeah. one of the things that radio was always famous for was, you know, air staff that would move around the country. You know, the famous line from the WKRP uh, opening, uh, you know, uh, moving from town to town, up and down the dial. And we kind of don't have to do that anymore. If there's someone that you really, really want to get as a contributor and they're on the other side of the country, you may have access to them now, whereas beforehand it would have been impossible to uh, have them be part of your operation. So, right, right. Hey, Steve, I have a, a quick comment. So, you know, I guess I might fall in the category of a case study here. I'm in my home office, but in a, after this uh, discussion, I need to get in my car and drive to the office because we have a, a meeting there with uh, some, uh, you know, uh, corporate management and, a, you know, town hall sort of a thing and, and some other reasons I need to be in my office office. Um, so this morning versus getting up early uh, and fighting drive time traffic to get to my office and be there for this conversation. Um, I just opted to have this conversation here and then drive into the office after drive time and uh, be still a part of that. But so, you know, and, and technically I could attend that uh, meeting uh, later today virtually, but the gap you have with the collaboration, the conversations, the relationship building, everything that goes into why we need to uh, be together as people uh, is is a uh, intangible that, that that's lost. On the other hand, like you said, it's a it's a mixed bag here. Uh, the flexibility and the ability to uh, collaborate technically that I would consider this a technical collaboration, but not a personal uh, collaboration. The accidental conversations you'll have with someone uh, because you happen to be physically in the same space. Uh, those things don't happen when we're remote. We generally, I generally am uh, scheduled uh, to speak with certain groups of people and, and talk about certain topics. And there's a little bit of, you know, water cooler talk, but not nearly what you'll have if you're in, in an office. My office happens to be uh, down down a hallway to the main conference room and, and which also has uh, the kitchen and all that sort of stuff. So there's quite a few people that will just stop in. Hey, how you doing? And oh, by the way, we were just thinking about a whatever fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And you have all this stuff that just sort of organically happens that you cannot put that on a spreadsheet and you really can't really clearly identify the gap that you're having by not physically being there. Sure. And, and I noticed, you know, on the opposite end of the virtual side of it, I mean, we've all heard, you know, um, I, and at least in the U.S., a, a lot of people are using the Zoom platform and, and the term Zoom fatigue has really become a, a thing um, in, in the last last years. Because like you, Roz, if I if I just want to have like a five minute conversation with somebody, well, that's like at least a 15 minute and sometimes a half an hour Zoom call. And I just put it, I wedge it into my Outlook calendar and there it is. Um, and then before you know it, I'm on my eighth Zoom call of the day, and 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 it's just exhausting. Uh, Sally, just you don't, yeah, I was about to say to your point, Steve. Sally, you don't have, and to what Roz was saying, Sally, you don't have the improvisation of a conversation that you have around the water cooler, where sometimes the best idea come uh, with hallway meetings that are improvised. With a Zoom, you have to schedule it. You have to have a topic. And it's rare that you just schedule Zoom randomly to talk about stuff that you haven't planned. Uh, I just wanted to say on the, on the remote work that, uh, that at RCS, we've been, we've been working on remote work for, for a long time. And the early manifestation of that was the, uh, what, we, uh, what we called at the time internet voice tracking. We, we just way before we were able to do that in browser and everything, people wanted to cut voice track from one location for another radio station that was situated on another location. And then we perfected that, and then we developed the browser-based aspect of operating a radio station for our automation system, for our music scheduling. And, and we found that when the pandemic arrived, these browser-based control of your automation system, of your voice tracking, went from being nice widget, nice gadget, to mission critical. And we got drenched with phone calls the few, first few weeks. 
what's that stuff that uh, that selector to go that uh, zeta to go how does that work can you help me set it up and can can i have some information on this and uh, and uh, the call speak through uh, through support because it became really mission critical tool so uh, so for a radio station i think everybody now is working um, remotely as see, much as they can uh, i think i'd like to add in here uh, see the case is that what typically happens uh, you know, uh, hybrid has, has its own core set of advantages, but so does that in-person touch. Uh, if I would like to put it in a sentence, uh, the amount of width uh, and the horizons that hybrid opens is not uh, was very difficult in a non-hybrid kind of a setup. But the amount of focus that you can get on solving a problem through an in-person conversation is immeasurable. So for focus, it's always person to person, right? But for a wider uh, horizon, for a, a wider distribution, hybrid is always a great uh, idea. So in like, again, if it's an individual contribution, probably hybrid is best. But when it comes to teamwork, uh, probably in per nothing can be in person. And as probably Steve and some, uh, some of the others were also mentioning, six Zoom calls and probably four hours of the day are gone. The, the topics that you discussed in six Zoom calls could actually be closed in one and a half hours in an in-person conversation at times, depending upon, again, the kind of work. So again, focus in person, but if you want to widen the horizons, probably hybrid. Right, right. well said, Udit, yes. Um, and, and then, you know, then, I don't know if anybody else is in this position, but from a from a benefit point of view, of course, like, I know a few of us, including our company, we are we are on the verge of looking at new real estate, and now um, we're we're really struggling to put to put into numbers. Well, if we you know, like Alex said, hybrid work is here to stay. Well, if we package that into a footprint of all right, so we're three hundred and fifty employees. Um, and what is the percentage then that is really going to be um, needed on the ground in a new rentable square feet for, for a new facility? And, you know, can we, you know, the money that we save from downsizing um, our footprint, uh, you know, I guess the question is, what's the, what's the benefit of that money? And, um, and, and can, that, can that offset at least some of this, some of the, uh, the disadvantages of hybrid work, um, I don't know if any, is anybody else struggling. Oh, yes, yeah, that's an obvious. Uh, to me, it's an obvious benefit, right? So, technology yeah. cheaper, better, faster. That's what that's that's what we do, right? Uh, and that technology keeps evolving. But this particular situation has definitely impacted the uh, traditional requirement for for bricks and mortar space. So, we've gone through a couple of cases where, especially in high uh, high rise type things or high rent areas where if we have multiple floors, which is an inconvenience to begin with mm -hmm. um, for collaboration, that's another conversation. Mm -hmm. But but really, when we can uh, manage the the people flow uh, and and maybe alternate people are coming in certain days, whatever, whatever. So you collapse that into one floor. You do gain, actually, the ability for some some measure of collaboration by people being on the same floor. But also, obviously, you're losing a whole floor of class A office space and the cost therein. And you can invest that in other ways to um, modernize uh, your plant and, and make it even more effective for, for the customer, internal and external customer. Right, right, very good. Yeah, and, and one thing, especially, you know, as far as like putting the money into the technology, one thing I'm seriously considering, and I think we all have to, is basically very flexible acoustic space, right? You can, um, instead of building out, say, 31 control rooms and studios or whatever, maybe we have just a, um, a set core of them for like the daily grind on air shows. But for production, maybe now we have like this, this swing space that's really acoustically very nice, but, you know, in one hour it can hold a conference meeting, an uh, uh, in-person conference meeting and, and, you know, with hybrid um, access. Um, and then, then it could be from somebody's just personal workspace for an hour. And then there could be a podcast team that comes in and records or something like that. 
Um, I, I see there's technology that's um, being developed for, you know, for very flexible space like this, where you can just basically, there might be some, you know, some um, IO equipment that's in there, some microphones or whatever, but basically everything is run on an iPad or something. And um, you can basically take advantage of that of that um, smaller footprint, but use it more flexibly. Yeah, real, real quick, I'll just jump in, uh, Alex. I yeah. see you, you you definitely have some things to say here on that topic. But uh, the other thing, then the traditional uh, per, you know format of a studio is with the thick walls and all. Other than you're talking about is the these days the video uh, piece of it and the sight lines and how to get everything where. The light, everything about it. acoustics is obviously a thing radio has always been dealing with, but relatively new. Some of us have been fooling with it for a while, but you know, when you modernize a space, you can then make it look uh, good, not just for the people in the room, but for the people who are not in the room, customers, etc. Very good. Yeah. Alex, did you want to jump in? Sure. Uh, we're in sort of the same situation where we're going to do a, a footprint uh, shrink in our place. Uh, jumping back to the, the cultural aspect of it, one thing that I will say is that I actually feel like it's a negative to have sort of acres of empty offices. Um, certainly when you have a lot of your workforce that is uh, that is on a hybrid schedule or permanent remote, uh, you don't want the place to feel empty. Uh, you want every part of it to, to be lively. Otherwise, you know, you don't want to have kind of a ghost town area of your floor. So I think there are actually reasons, aside from just cost, to want to shrink your footprint. As far as to how much, uh, if you ask three architects, you'll get three different uh, ratios as to how much space you have. Um, certainly, we are going to have to get into a world where space reuse is a thing. Um, I feel like the concept you brought up production studios, uh, the concept of having one production person to one production studio is going to be something we have to change, uh, especially if they're on a rotating schedule. I feel like scheduling systems are going to become very important. So where you might have like the, the panel on the outside of your conference room that shows the schedule based on Outlook room utilization, you're probably going to have to start doing that for operational spaces now as well, just to make sure that someone who's expecting to come in and record in a particular production room or is in on a particular day has that room blocked out so they have a place to go work. Um, I'm looking at the concept of every room should be able to do everything. I agree that we're probably going to still maintain some dedicated on-air studios, uh, but every other room should be able to be an audio production room, a video edit booth, an interview space, uh, a video backdrop, uh, and we need to design our facilities around that ability going forward. These rooms have to be able to be much more flexible to justify the real estate that we allocate them going forward. Mm -hmm. Very good. <clears throat> you know, Alex, um, boy, you you hit on a, a yeah, a very, um, I think, a, a, a important thing that kind of goes unsaid, but the, the empty office space. I mean, we've all been into our office now, at least maybe, you know, in the U.S. here. And um, I'm, I'm one of them. I'm in. I'm in a few days a week, but still, at at the the busiest day, we only have about forty percent of our staff in, and we are spread over about four different floors. So it just feels odd. And when I first started going in, um, when kind of the pandemic lifted a little bit, it, it felt like I was there on a holiday. You know, we're all technicians. We all work overnights, and we all work special holidays. You know, to to get you know to get to do invasive technology work. And that's what it felt like. There was nobody there and it just felt empty. And, and what was even odder is that when I go online to a Zoom call, <clears throat> that, then like that's where all the action was. All the action was virtual. <laughs> but, but when I look out into the office and I walk around to the cooler, there's, there's nobody there. And it was just such an unsettling feeling that was odd. And I'll, I'll tell one more story, then it will open it up a little bit. But um, just a few weeks ago, we, had, uh, we were celebrating um, uh, uh, an achievement and um, our entire technical team came in it, and it was the first and that's about three dozen people and it was the first time in three years that we'd all seen each other in person again and you know these people were talking about it every day since then it was it was just something you can't really put words on but um, but people felt it and uh, we had great conversations, very, very organic conversations, um, personal and professional and technology related. Um, and it was just, uh, you know, people are still talking about it to this day. So yeah, these things are incredible. Well, what it's worth in, uh, in some of the customer we have that have embraced uh, the virtual as much as possible for their studio operation, you have studios for clusters of uh, stations in the same location. 
even the studios can be repurposed with uh, big screens uh, on the walls and behind, and, and a studio can become instantly one brand or another. So depending on the time of the day, which are the, the hosts that are going to be in there, uh, and sometimes the studio itself is completely empty because the three, four, five stations that are in the cluster are all operating remotely, and uh, and there's nobody in the studio. So even the the crux of a radio station, the studio, is becoming a shared uh, environment, um, and that's uh, that's that's a big change from before because that was the the whole sacred place. This is the studio right. for this station. This is that studio for that station, and so forth. Even that is becoming uh, mixed and shared. Right, right, and, and like you said, with the vid, uh, video screens, I mean that that can add add to the video aspect that Roz was talking about too, because I, I think we're we're all we're all and some like Roz said some um, we, some of us have been doing it longer than others, but we're all we're all basically trying to find really the um, the future audience, right? And and I think visual is is a big part of that. Um, I know Alex, you're doing you you've got millions of subscribers on YouTube. Um, and, uh, you know, you've got a very vibrant, um, uh, audience on that and, and, you know, the, the ratio of, of, you know, people watching streams versus people listening off air, uh, that's gotta be an interesting ratio at this point and, and changing a bit. Oh, absolutely. It's, and the same thing with, uh, delayed listening, uh, podcast, you know, podcast reutilization of content. Uh, again, I think also not only every room having to be flexible, all of our content has to be flexible to fit on all of our platforms. If we're going to do an interview, it's going to be on the radio and on video and on a podcast. And we want to reuse this content on as many of our distribution platforms as possible as we are trying to find that new audience. Um, not everybody is on listening to our morning show from 6 to 10 a.m. They, you know, they have their own schedules and we want to make sure that we capture them uh, when we can. And that's just, you know, a little bit of that. Actually, a lot of that shift has happened over the last couple of years, but it was something it was a road we were going down anyway already. We already knew that uh, this was where we needed to go as an organization. We needed to broaden our distribution and be available to people. And it's worked out really well for us. Um, you know, we go out and the old radio remote is gone a lot of the time. And we go out and we instead do a live video stream. We actually send a crew out uh, to go and do an event on live streaming video, whereas before it might have been audio only. So right, right. And, and, very well. and Uda, I think you're living this every day. I've seen some of your content. Um, I mean, you have, you know, I think so much of your content is is nonlinear. Um, um, do you have a, you can has has the has the pandemic or has the hybrid workflow changed your strategy for for developing nonlinear content? So yeah, uh, the pandemic and the hybrid strategy, hybrid uh, model definitely changed our strategy. But I actually pretty much reflect uh, uh, Alex's thoughts that uh, you know everything has to be flexible. And everything has to be multi-purpose, whether it is content or whether it's physical studios. Uh, you can't think of a studio for a station anymore. You can't think of a studio for a person anymore. You, the studio has to solve all purposes, right from catering to an audio show, to a podcast, to a station, to a video show, to every form in which a content could exist. And that's how we are doing it. Likewise. See, in the digital ecosystem, the main crux is the cost of production and then the consumption. You have to focus on reducing the cost of production, whether it's audio production or it's video production. So we're focusing on all of that uh, holistically. And when you talk of cost of production, it is not just the human resources and the information required or the amount you spend on content, but it's also the brick and mortar involved the real estate occupied and the time occupied for it. So you have to look at it holistically as you move into the digital ecosystem. Uh, you are not, not competing with fixed set of 50 players, which you might compete with uh, in a TV ecosystem or in a radio ecosystem. You are complete. Uh, you're competing with a vlogger who's walking on the street or a podcaster who's creating content from his own house. So you're competing with millions of competition at the same time. So the more nimble and agile you are, the better are your chances of success. Very true. I'm thinking of all the TikTok stars with millions of followers, right? And they're just on their phone every day. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, like Mirti Plus made it a point to work on social 
for us, social is a very big thing. Uh, nobody could think of Mirchi being the largest player in terms of interactions, as you call likes, comments, and shares on social. But Mirchi actually has more interactions than some of the top media houses in the country. And that's that's how we're working on it. That's incredible. Um, you know, um, uh, uh, Omar Essek from Red Tech has a- asked an interesting question, and I don't have the answer to this, so I'm, re- I'm going to put it out to the group. But he's asking, how challenging is hybrid working in markets where broadband is still a challenge? Anybody have any thoughts on that? I, I have one comment on that. Yeah. You know, most of the mar- a market in general, broadband, I wouldn't say is a challenge. But what, what happens is as the, you get the remote workers at their homes, and and the, every single endpoint has its different capabilities and where that really is becomes a concern and part of my job function is the business continuity planning so for instance uh traditionally everyone would know that they had to operate from the from the main facility which has redundant power tri- triple redundant isp whatever you know it's a very hardened facility uh, that we know we can confidently originate and distribute our content at least out of that location that's flipped over a bit where you have a uh, key uh, either content contributors or key management types that are are housed at home a lot of, a lot of the uh, business has been distributed into homes and other areas where we don't have that hardening they may or may not have alternate power they may or may they're probably only going to have they might have an ISP connection and then a, a hotspot maybe, but but it, it makes the technology support uh, different. Uh, you have to take that into, into consideration when you get into alternate modes of operation, because just real quick and I'll stop, but you know, the hybrid is a new normal, right? And so just like I am here, technically most of the time my ISP is pretty solid. So far I haven't dropped offline here, but I very well could. Uh, in two seconds, I could be gone from this conversation, and, and that is what it is. Same Whereas here. at the Harden facility, it would be much more uh, resilient to that sort of thing. And so now we've extended our business risk out to these sorts of locations, and we have to think about that. Very true. Um, yeah, we realized early on. I mean, you know, we, we've all been, we've all. I think everyone on this call is is somehow in, in impacted by environmental uh, challenges. New York City went, you know, went under six feet of water in Hurricane Sandy. Um, and um, so early on in the pandemic, we shipped, um, you know, at a small UPSs, I don't know, um, one KVA or something, 1.2 KVA UPSs. <clears throat> Basically, we, we, uh, we, did, we selected them by weight. Like how how much can somebody carry up their st- steps to their apartment, right? So so everybody's got about an hour of runtime or so. Should they lose power? But if they lose power, will they you know will that keep up their ISP and, and things? It, it's really it's really kind of struggling on a string there. But so even in New York City, um, there there is very very poor service out there that's um, just frankly illegal from a from a um, carrier's perspective. I'll write something else that that a lot of residential ISPs uh, do network upgrades and maintenance in the middle of the night. I found I have one cable modem provider that, uh, you know, Sunday morning at uh, three in the morning, it's not unusual for the service to go down for an hour while they do, you know, some endpoint upgrade. And if we are relying on this to be accessible around the clock or on weekends, we have to think about that. There does have to be a plan B. I mean, they the broadband hotspots, uh, we have outstanding broadband service here and everyone's deploying 5G and ultra wideband in this area. And that's been very, very resilient for us. It's almost better than a lot of the home ISPs. Sometimes it's some, it's just that someone is subscribing to the lowest tier of broadband at home. They have it, but you know it's at the, at the low end and someone's watching Netflix on the other side of the house while they're trying to do a radio show and you end up with some, some conflict there. So mm-hmm. every one of those we've had to solve on a case by case basis. And we truly found that it's variable. It's, uh, someone may have a great connection, someone may not. And there's typically only two broadband providers at most, maybe three uh, to the average home in this area. So there's not a lot of choice if, uh, if you have an issue. Yeah. And I think in terms of the tools that, that you use for hybrid work, um, the technology today has to be browser-based, right? We want a thin client that is as economical as possible in the amount of bandwidth it requires with as little work done locally by the CPU, but you push the work, the heavy the heavy work on the server side. 
so that it really just is a thin class. And that's why you want to make sure that the tools that uh, your employees use, particularly in broadcasting to, uh, to do the show, um, are browser-based thin clients that don't require a thick pipe uh, that will choke or, or pose any other problems. And thanks God nowadays, uh, that, that's uh, something that's uh, uh, very, very common. Right. Yeah, I, well, think it, I would reflect Philippe's thoughts on this because uh, what's happening is uh, as the networks are improving and improving drastically, uh, most of the processing is happening server side. In fact, for most of the electronics companies, specifically the phone operators, right? The future is probably reducing the amount of hardware uh, and, uh, being introduced in phone sets and focusing more on the network speeds so that every processing happens server side. And uh, on the client side, there is very limited processing that's required. And that's where the world is moving. Apparently, in this part of the world, uh, uh, the pandemic uh, forced everyone to install a UPS, right? So that if there is a power failure, they're connected. But again, at the same time, what helped was that uh, mobile data is as cheap as it can be, specifically in South Asia, right? So. Uh, unless it's live streaming for anything that is non-live, probably a lot of times for even live, uh, 4G and 5G connections uh, support it pretty well. But of course, you cannot ignore the chance of a ISP home dropout. So that does happen and lives can be impacted. Live streams can be impacted at times. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Very good. And, and <clears throat> Philippe, I was going to um, um, segue uh, to you again um, because this whole this topic of yeah broadband infrastructure and you know whether it's tenuous or whether it's resilient, um, you know I know you know you're you're building um, products for for really operating a radio station completely in the cloud, and I just wondered from your experience are there are there some markets where you basically would say, um, you know what what what's it, that that market's not ready for, quite for that yet a little bit or or is it have you have you seen it basically you know. Um, re resilient enough to support that technology. It, it is it is rare that we have a bandwidth issue to uh, to run uh, operation of a radio station at any of our customers. We operate in places that are um, very interesting. We uh, we operate in uh, in in Africa uh, in places where bandwidth is uh, is a little complicated. But uh, but you do have five G over there. Uh, in many places already. And guess what? One 5G tower will solve the problems of many, many, many bandwidth uh, uh, issues uh, that you're trying to solve by uh, having a, a dedicated line or, uh, or or any other way of old fashioned way, I should say, uh, of transmitting the data. And then uh, if you have several providers, um, there are many tools that have two uh, SIM that will allow you to operate on dual uh, 5G uh, connections. So the cloud operation really is safe from that point of view. And our tools, uh, the RCS uh, tools like Zeta Cloud and, uh, and all the tools that we operate in the cloud have several advantages um, for the, for the uh, cloud uh, of Zeta, for example. You can have um, devices that will cache your um, content at the foot of the transmitter so that you have direct um, uh, uh, use of that content without it being transmitted real time and live uh, over an internet connection. So we, we cache as much as possible. But in general, the, the connection itself uh, to, to get the operation going is not anymore an issue that we can, we can see. We also have uh, offices in, uh, in uh, Kuala Lumpur with 180 employees. We have 220 employees in Mumbai. They're, they're doing discovery for our media monitors branch, which is the monitoring aspect of, uh, of the radio and TV uh, in, in North America. Every one of those employees working from home in those regions, and we don't have any problem whatsoever uh, for the connection. So um, it, it's actually, uh, time is on our side on this one, so uh, hopefully we won't have to uh, to worry about that uh, very soon. It's already uh, just barely in the back of our mind. Okay. In fact, I would like to I would like to certify what uh, Philippe just said. We we are actually using RCS cloud based services for deferring stations 
to the time zone where the user is uh, listening to. He was mentioning caching, right? So mm -hmm. uh, we're actually using it to make a user listen to a stream that is playing in Delhi, India at 10 a.m. Uh, at 10 a.m. East Coast time in New York, right? And it works like a charm. So it works pretty well. It's absolutely seamless and cloud is the way ahead by all means. Yeah. Um, Philippe, back to you for a second. Could you um, could you just expand a little bit about the development of your cloud solution? I mean, um, I mean, it, it seems like it's the right place at the right time, right? right? But you must have been thinking of mobility and, and things like that even prior to the pandemic. Yes, we were we were the first company to introduce a, a browser based control of uh, of the automation system and of the uh, music scheduling system. Uh, which were uh, not a uh, remote connection to your computer, but a real thin client, as, as we discussed earlier, a real thin client mm -hmm. where the, the, the work is done uh, server side. And, uh, and the cloud was only a, a natural evolution of, uh, of that uh, work. It's really a way for a radio station to, um, to have a centralization of the content, centralization of the operation, and um, uh, as safe as it can be, our, our disaster recovery uh, solution, for example, is the perfect example of something which is completely today uh, modern, up to date, and uh, and economically uh, viable. Um, for a few bucks a month, we uh, we have a copy of your radio station. Everything, the content, the music, the spots, the jingles, the voice track, the commercials everything gets uh, uh, copied in real time in the cloud. And should any problem occur on the ground, be it um, a fire in the studio, be it uh, a cyber attack, uh, anything that can cause your operation to go um, uh, bad, you can flip a switch, a browser switch, and, um, and your operation will continue um, on the on a stream that you can redirect to your transmitter without any noticeable difference for the customers. So if they hear your music, they hear your segue, your segue point. In fact, it's a complete Zeta system operating in the cloud in a uh, Linux environment, in containers, in Docker's. It's real cloud system, uh, not not a SQL server in the cloud. It's a, a real uh, a, a real cloud system. And, uh, and that allows the uh, continuity of the, uh, of the operation. So it's really something that, uh, that nowadays, um, uh, from a business point of view, I can give you the statistics, but about three out of four new Zeta customer takes the uh, uh, insurance of having the disaster recovery uh, because that avoid having to uh, uh, have a second location to have redundant this, redundant that, because when you have a cyber attack, uh, we had one customer who had a cyber attack. Uh, we had several customers who had cyber attacks. You know, the, the uh, uh, things like the, uh, the crypto locker, for example, where they, uh, they take your content hostage. And you have to turn off all the computers in your organization so that you can do an antivirus on every single one of them. And still, you will probably not recover your assets anyway if you don't pay the ransom. So, uh, so we can protect you against that. And that's, I think that's part of the, uh, the, the security that uh, a, a media wants today. Sure. And, and so many of us, <clears throat> including ourselves, I mean, like uh, after, after 9-11, 20 years ago, um, we all built out, um, you know, kind of expensive brick and mortar uh, disaster recovery studios and and um and rack rooms and things like that um you know uh, best practices is basically to build it like you know no closer than 90 miles from your environmental area and and actually you know and we built out in philadelphia which is like i don't know a couple hundred miles but um that um you know that saved us in hurricane sandy 10 years ago but now you know that is that is an expense uh, and a significant expense and then the ethernet private lines that you're connecting to with big pipes and things like that so um that i i do see cloud as the uh, the way to go from an economic and resiliency point of view and and, and to save a lot of bucks too not to um, mention real estate of course yeah absolutely right right um i see we had a we had a question here that's interesting um from um daniel slentz um now, if anybody else can see it, I'll read it. Um, are you seeing more audio quality issues from remote sites? I guess, you know, considering the uh, the hybrid um, 
hybrid work environment. And um, and yeah, I'll be the first to raise my hand. And sure, it's um, you know that's why we've you know we went to considerable expense um, and effort to to build out these uh, mobile sites. Like right at, even at the in the beginning of the pandemic, we went in with masks and gloves, and we you know into into our into our our team's living rooms, you know, and and with some acoustic treatment and things. And we did our best that we could with you know good quality microphones and acoustic treatment and um, and and Comrexes and um, uh, um, you know different different codecs. Um, but sure, there are, you know, uh, we've seen and heard we, um, issues, you know, when bandwidth chokes and things like that. Uh, has anybody else on this call, you know, experienced that or, or found ways to work around that to keep the audio quality up? Um, sure. I mean, we have had that, you know, again, something we approach on a case by case basis. Some people we find that their home setups sound great. Some people we find that they have issues. But the biggest thing is listening with a critical ear. Um, I would not say that we find poor audio quality acceptable. Uh, you may run into it and you may deal with it for a brief period of time, but every one of those is an issue that needs to be resolved, whether it's a microphone swap out. A lot of the time we simply find that people are just overdriving the inputs to codex and, and don't know it. Um, so we work with them. A lot of it is honestly just working with the talent because now they're playing the role of engineer. Uh, you know, whereas beforehand we were down the hall and if we heard something on the air, we just run into the studio and fix it. Right. Uh, now they're 40 miles away and we can't do that. So we do a lot of remote troubleshooting. Uh, we do offline testing with people and try and resolve it. But I do think that the actual quality of our product and the concept of broadcast quality is something that we can't let go. Um, we, this is again, something that differentiates us from the podcasts, from, from everything that's not what we do as a business. We're, we're professional broadcasters and we still need to make sure that our product reflects that. Right, right. And you know, Alex, just to jump in for a quick second on something you said, the um, you know, this this point about you know supporting all this mobile workforce. We didn't talk about it yet, but um, even even though we have a pretty you know we have a pretty filled out technical team, but the the workload on this team really has gone up. I, I calculated somewhere between twenty five and forty percent. Because um, you know, and not not even including the initial go out with the truck and setting up the studios, but just the ongoing support. Um, you know, um, you have to you know you have to get them on a Zoom call. You have to schedule it, and then you have to work with them. All, the uh, the help desk tickets are just taking longer to resolve uh, because you just have to work with them in a remote situation. Um, and frankly, there's a lot more there's a lot more equipment out there now. There's all these codecs. Or, you know, everybody's got a laptop. And so I just from a technology and um, management point of view, you know, um, you know, we have to m make sure we we, you know, advocate to keep our technical teams um, fat, if you will. You know, we want to keep them well staffed so we can support all this extra work. It is truly extra work. And, um, you know, now is not the time to um, to to start, you know, um, thinning down our technical teams. I just wanted to throw that out there because that. We've, we've just seen such a big uptick in support like that. The customer that we see using remote voice tracking to the to that listener comment, yeah. I think the first thing our customer do, the radio station does when somebody wants to operate remotely is to get them a good microphone because that <laughs> you can't do without that. If it's not an SM7, you know, send the USB version of, uh, of that, but uh, Get them a good microphone because it starts there. The guy can have big pipes. If you don't have a good microphone, it's going to sound like crap no matter what you do after that. Right, right, right. And not only a good microphone, but something that's actually, you know, matched with the acoustic environment. You know, uh, um, you know, a big, you know, you could spend a lot of money on a large a diaphragm um, uh, condenser microphone. And, and then you're going to get, you know, all that, <laughs> you're going to hear everything. And sometimes you don't want to hear everything. You don't want to hear the air conditioning rumble or the or the refrigerator rumble or something like that. Um, sometimes an SM7 or something, a good dynamic mic, directional mic is is, is sometimes the best selection. Um, um, I, good, I, yeah. You made a very good point about support. Um, even just on the regular IT side, not on the broadcast side, every time that we have an employee leave the organization or join the organization, we now have to ship or retrieve uh, hardware from everyone. So I find that just the logistics of making sure we're keeping track of what's out in the field, who has what, who needs what, um, that itself is much, much harder than it used to be. Um, we used to just stop by somebody's desk and that's 
no longer the game. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, hey, listen, we're, we're coming up on 10 minutes here. And I um, and I, I just wanted to touch on, I guess, even just um, on the technical aspects, um, you know, um, the technology has really shifted on the on the IT for broadcast side to, you know, to containers, Kubernetes and things like that. Um, I just wanted to kind of open it up to see, um, you know, if we can leave the audience with any kind of, you know, um, not tricks of the trade, but what's worked and what hasn't worked for us in the, in the last few years of the pandemic to support, you know, to support hybrid work. You know, Philippe's got a, um, a great cloud solution. We've all, we've all tried, you know, other, um, you know, techniques and things like that. Any kind of just, you know, like, you know, um, tales from the road that, um, that have either worked or not worked for any of us? Um, so very early on, we actually, this was a happy coincidence. Uh, we were looking at swapping out our, our video digital asset management system, uh, sort of right before the pandemic happened. We had an on-premise uh, asset management platform uh, that was at the end of its useful life. And we decided it was time to move that to cloud. And with the amount of video content we generate, the storage of, of all this video in, in cloud-based resources is a big lift to get it there and to maintain it there. But we were very lucky to have made this decision at that point in time because this system has become essential in running our digital operations because now everybody is able to share footage, to contribute, to edit, um, and to work in workflow process from home. So that was uh, something that we found was absolutely essential. We do have to think about that side of the business. It's not just the radio automation platforms. It's production. It's digital production. It's uh, promotions department scheduling. All of these platforms that we use need to migrate to the cloud versions of them. Unfortunately, a lot of that is out there and it's become the standard. Mm -hmm. You know, and somebody um, men mentioned uh, um, telephony on this call too. And um, Alex, I have a yeah, very similar timeline story like you did. Um, just, just I think in December 2019, we had just finished virtualizing our phone system. Um, and, you know, we were damn lucky that we just, we did it then because how else would you, um, how else would you call, screen calls from home and things like that? Um, that just, you know, that that um, that was like the single and single largest virtualization project that we had taken on that year, and and that and that really saved our live um, broadcast infrastructure um, throughout the, throughout the pandemic and now because now you can now you can screen calls from home, you can take calls from home and everything. Whereas you know with a just with a uh, um, you know racks and racks of a PBX equipment, you know we would have been very, very hard pressed to do anything within the first six months of the pandemic. Right, I was, that's actually just a good general argument for, for staying on the edge of technology whenever you can. You never really, we can't predict the future. We don't know what's coming. Yeah. Um, but if we're not constantly modernizing our plants, we're just not going to have the systems in place and the resources to face things like this when they happen. Sure. I was going to mention something along the same lines that, uh, you know, every, you know, with general disaster stuff, uh, you, you get into a point where uh, if you're preparing for, for that eventuality, it's, a, it's an interesting conversation to convince people to invest in something that, you know, what's the percentage of time you're actually going to do this. Um, but when it happens, then all of a sudden, how come we didn't have even more of this? So it's always this sort of a thing. But um, going through a pandemic or, or any sort of a disruption to the business, I think um, hopefully the retention of the memory of, of how it was fortunate uh, or unfortunate to have certain things in place uh, drives the decisions as we start to evaluate what, what are the priorities of investment and technology. And uh, when you do these significant investments, what do we get with that? Uh, so I'd point out to uh, Philippe in, in his DR facet. You know, if you're going to do a, an upgrade or change something, what what about it uh, do you get along with that? Uh, you know, whether even a transmitter or so, something like that nowadays. You know, solid state transmitters being multi frequency. If you can change the antenna, make it broadband. You know, there's all sorts of things that you start to imagine, and, and as we look over technology in general, uh, the check boxes, uh, the security, the DR functionality, the remote flexibility. You know. All of this stuff, is it remote controllable like a console? Can you control it from a distance? All, all that stuff becomes, oh, yeah, check that box. But that box may not have been there uh, just a few short years ago. But now, uh, because of everything we know about cloud and computing and networks, uh, don't forget the resiliency of a network, you know, checking these boxes becomes um, just sort of commonplace and you get more bang for your buck, if you will, when you're proposing an investment. 
Right. And Ross, am I remembering right something you told me a while ago? Did, did you actually, I know you travel to your to your affiliate stations and you're doing, I think, tabletop exercises. Am I right that you actually um, tabletop like a pandemic? <laughs> well, for years. OK, so we were uh, owned by a private company, Cox Enterprises, which we had a you know whole division that did nothing but security and, and BCP stuff. And so one of the tabletop exercises we always did was a potential worldwide pandemic, such as bird flu, that sort of thing. And, and it was always like, OK, well, you know, this is something we have. We'll run through the exercise just in case the whole world uh, supply chain, that sort of stuff. Well, after we transitioned to a new ownership group, uh, because of me living in Florida and dealing with hurricanes all the time, it's like, well, this whole BCP thing, you know, you can just handle that. And because, you know, perceptually it seemed like it was a easy, <laughs> easy thing. Uh, three months in, we had a worldwide pandemic, which is the most, you know, the most difficult thing because a hurricane, tornado, fire, anything that's very localized, you know, depending on you know everything I just said, and you've lived it with 9-11 and all that sort of stuff, you know, the whole country wasn't impacted uh, in a way, but, you know, it depends on the, the event, but a worldwide pandemic, there's so many things that you have to think about, which we all know, um, and you, it's hard to tabletop all of those things and prepare enough in advance for all of that, because like any un unexpected event, you always exceed your capacity locally to function. And that's where you reach out, you know, beyond this, the uh, impact zone. You just mentioned a little bit ago, you prepare an offsite facility 90 miles from the epicenter, if you will. Well, okay, the whole world is, is affected. So how, how can you build that in? So, so that sort of exercise, um, you know, fortunately or not, you know, we, we got through it and a lot of lessons learned. And it's not just applicable to a worldwide pandemic, but definitely applicable and serves the purpose of all of the local and regional issues that we may encounter. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, hey, we're coming up on time. Um, you know, does any um, anybody want to just take 30 seconds or so to, you know, um, summarize what you're thinking on, on this topic and and we can round out that way? I don't think that Ross just did a great job of summarizing it. I mean, it really is, you know, we, we don't know which particular problem we're going to face going forward. We need to be ready for as many of them as we possibly can. And we need to constantly be looking at the flexibility and the advantages in every area of all of our systems and be advocating for technology in our, in our business that makes sense and gives us these opportunities and solves these problems for us. So it's part well of said. What we need to do. Yes. Yep. Yep. Philippe, would it? Do you want to uh, mention anything? Yeah, just, just one one thing, um, uh, one takeaway. Cloud is cloud is your friend, and you can have as much as you want or as little. You just want to dip your toe in the water, you can do that and take a little bit to get to see how that friend behaves. Is it reliable? Is it easy to use? Does it work for you or not? And you can embrace it all at once, but you don't have to. You can just dip a toe in the water with cloud and see how it goes. It's uh, one thing for sure. It's it's here to stay. Yeah. So uh, uh, I'm of a very similar view. Cloud based flexibility is the route ahead by all means, because cloud is the only thing which connects with every damn digital equipment that you have, even where you're sitting or where you're walking or anything, any any digital equipment in your life is now more or less being connected to the cloud one way or the other. So cloud-based flexibility is what will support you in reducing your cost, in supporting you through any pandemic, and in giving you as much flexibility as possible. Very good. Well said. And that takes us right up to the hour. So um, I want to be prompt and um, we all have other things to go. Our next Zoom call, if you will, I guess. <laughs> so, but I want to thank every one of you here um, for uh, what for a, a great, great, intriguing and, and I think a very inventive conversation. And I want to thank Red Tech for hosting this and putting this together. So thank you, everybody. And uh, enjoy the rest of Radio Week. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.